Well, we had a wonderful summer uh, in Psalms, looking uh, at several different Psalms, but now the calendar is turning to the fall, and even maybe the weather a little bit, as it didn't reach 100 degrees yesterday, so that was a, uh, certainly a blessing. Uh, but it is now time to return to the Gospel of Luke. And uh, this morning's message marks the beginning of the third year of our study of Luke's gospel. And uh, for those of you who are wondering, we are nearing the midway point. And uh, Luke 9.51 is about halfway through uh, from a literary perspective. Obviously, it's not the, the middle chapter since there's 24 chapters in Luke, but it is the literary center of the gospel. And so we are coming up on that very quickly here. And uh, we are taking our time. For those of you who uh, have not been here for our series on Luke, you might wonder what in the world we've talked about for two years in just eight and a half chapters. Uh, But we are taking our time because it is necessary for us to firmly grasp the life and teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. We must understand these things. It's not enough simply to fly through them and then check them off the list and say, well, we're done with Luke and let's move on to uh, some other book. We want to understand what's here. We're going to preach something in the Bible every week. And so we might as well preach it so that we understand it uh, rather than just moving along as quickly as possible to say that we've uh, covered mass, uh, mass amounts of, of scripture that we don't really understand. And so we don't want to rush through this. There is gold, silver, and precious stones that are buried in this account of Luke's gospel, in his account of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. And uh, I suppose, some of you might not believe this, but I suppose we could finish Luke by the end of the year. But we couldn't finish it by the end of the year and have any sort of lasting grip on what is happening in this gospel or any depth of appreciation of what Luke is trying to do in his telling of his account. And uh, so we're taking our time and we're moving along uh, slowly through the gospel and meditating on it. In addition to that, there is something beautiful and there is something humbling and there is something joyous about walking with our Lord as he walked this earth when he uh, was here as a man. And, uh, and it's, it's something that uh, personally is, is thrilling to me just to spend week after week after week with Jesus on the dusty roads of Galilee and Judea, hearing him teach, uh, thinking through his miracles and reading about them and studying them. Uh, I am certainly in no hurry to leave Jesus in, in the Gospel of Luke. It is such a delight and a joy Uh, just to think about him and his incarnation week after week. And so hopefully uh, you will join me in that uh, that experience of just enjoying spending time with our Savior and thinking through his incarnation. We are in Luke 9.27 this morning. Uh, We had a cliffhanger a few months back in Luke 9.23 through 27. And uh, Luke 9.27 is the last verse on discipleship in this paragraph. Now, discipleship has really been the theme of chapter 9. It it went all the way back to chapter 9, verse 1. Jesus is transitioning in this section of Luke from his preaching and teaching ministry to his march to Jerusalem, where he will be condemned, where he will suffer, where he will be crucified, and where he will rise again on the third day. And so uh, he is moving now to the completion of this phase of his earthly ministry. The teaching and preaching and healing phase will soon uh, be wrapping up. There will be things that happen uh, from Luke 9, 51 and on that are, are in that vein, but they will be on the road to Jerusalem. They won't be primarily what he is going about to do. At the end of chapter 9, he sets his face to Jerusalem and he makes that final journey. And so as he is making this transition, he is in earnest about making sure his disciples understand who he is, what he came to do, their mission in the world, and and what he will require of them as far as character and works once he has ascended to heaven. And so to that end, in Luke 9, 1, Jesus sends them out on a mission of their own. And we saw in Luke 9, 1 through 9, Uh, the characteristics that Jesus looks for and requires of those who will serve him. 
And these characteristics and requirements were especially necessary of those who would preach his word and teach his word. And so Jesus sends out the apostles on a mission to evaluate them, to shape their character, to give them some on-the-job experience before they are sent out on their own after Jesus' ascension. Then we saw in verses 10 through 17 that Jesus gives the disciples a test as he asks them to feed a multitude of people that have come to hear Jesus teach and be healed. Uh, 5,000 men plus however many women and children were present. And so we, when we saw that, we saw there were upwards of 20,000 people that were there. And uh, all they had to feed this massive group of people was a Lunchable from one little boy. And Jesus said, you figure it out, disciples. They failed the test. But Jesus, in his mercy and in his patience, equipped them through the passage so that they were able to succeed. And he taught them through this that when he puts these kinds of tests in front of them where they don't have the resources and they are unable to do what he has commanded them to do, that they need to take a step of faith and trust him to supply that need and to supply the strength that they find lacking in themselves. Jesus is able and he is willing to strengthen us in our weaknesses And so we should obey him even when we feel weak and impotent. Then we came to the confession of a true disciple in verses 18 through 22. And we saw that all true disciples make a biblical confession of faith in Jesus Christ. And a biblical confession of faith consists of two things. A proper understanding of who Jesus is, his person, and a proper understanding of what Jesus came to do, his work. All biblical confessions of Jesus Christ must have both of these elements and they must be in line with the truth of who Jesus is and what he came to do. If you say that Jesus is God, but you don't understand what he came to do, you can't make a biblical confession of faith. If you understand uh, that Jesus came to die on a cross, but you don't think he's God, you can't make a biblical confession of faith. Both of these elements are absolutely vital for all true disciples to understand. And so you can see that we, we have here Jesus equipping the disciples in this chapter, getting them ready to go out and be on their own without him bodily present with them after his sufferings. His focus has narrowed here. He is no longer as focused on the crowd. Certainly the crowds are there, but even when the crowds show up, it's to give a lesson to the disciples about discipleship. Now that sort of is the, uh, the, the fast version of what we spent a number of weeks on in Luke 9. And it brings us up to verse 23, where Jesus lays out the demands of discipleship. And that is uh, the paragraph that we are in, verses 23 through 27, the demands of discipleship. The crowd seems to be back here. There seems to be a group of people larger than the disciples, but they are not the primary emphasis or the primary focus. Jesus, in this paragraph is separating the true disciples from the false disciples, the genuine followers from the hypocrites, the the real thing from the pretenders. And the theme of this paragraph that begins in verse 23 and runs all the way through verse 27 is this. If we would be genuine followers of Jesus, we must understand and accept the demands of discipleship. We must understand and accept the demands of discipleship if we would be followers of Jesus. It is not enough for us to understand them and reject them. And it is not enough to say, I'll do whatever Jesus wants and have no idea what Jesus wants you to do. You need to understand these demands and you need to accept them to be a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to make something very, very clear, crystal clear. A disciple and a Christian are interchangeable terms. These are not two separate things. There is a theology that would differentiate a disciple from a Christian. I was taught this theology in college, uh, sort of a two-stage salvation process. You get saved, and then at some point down the road, you decide to become a disciple and really, really get committed to Jesus, really get serious about your faith. There is no biblical basis for this. And we saw that last time. Those who fail to meet the demands of discipleship 
do not find themselves on the day of judgment rewarded less. They find themselves condemned. Those who do not meet the demands of discipleship are not those who, when they get to judgment, have their life work burned up, but they themselves are saved, though as through fire. Those who fail to meet the demands of discipleship lose their lives, forfeit their souls, and Jesus is ashamed of them at his coming. These are not lesser Christians. This is not the JV Christians, the, you know, the, the, the believers who don't meet the demands. There's only one kind of Christian, and that's a disciple of Jesus Christ. There aren't two kinds of Christians. And what we are talking about then, when we talk about the demands of Jesus, these demands of discipleship is nothing less than salvation itself. When we talk about being a disciple of Jesus, when I mention following Jesus, I am not saying take your Christian life to the next level. I am saying be a Christian. Live the Christian life. Now, understanding this is a great source of blessing and comfort for the genuine Christian. This is not something onerous or difficult for the, for the genuine Christian. You say, well, why is that? Because how else can you know if you are truly converted or if you are a false brother or sister if Jesus doesn't give you the tests? What other way do you determine the condition of your soul except Jesus make clear to you what are the demands of those who would follow him? You see, the doctrine of justification is not a doctrine you feel. You never feel justified. Justification happens in heaven. It happens in the courtroom of God, before the throne of God, before the judgment seat of God. It is a declaration of God. It is not an emotion. So how do you know if God has declared you righteous? Well, you don't go home and, and try to feel forgiven or try to feel just. There's a lot of people who feel righteous and feel justified who aren't. How would you discern if you are in the faith if Jesus never said, here are the characteristics of those who are in the faith? In fact, Jesus says that many will be deceived on the day of judgment. One of the most frequent warnings in the New Testament, if not the most frequent warning, is do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Now, the necessary conclusion, if the New Testament writers over and over and over and over again say to us, do not be deceived, is that we are prone to be deceived. And that there will be many people who will be deceived. And so Jesus gives the demands of discipleship not to place an unbearable burden on our back, but to set us free from wondering, am I a disciple of Jesus Christ? Have I been saved? Has the Holy Spirit regenerated me? This is how you can tell if you are one of the genuine followers of Christ or if you're a pretender, a false disciple. This is how you can know that you have eternal life as you look at these demands. So for the true Christian, the demands of discipleship are a welcome blessing. We want Jesus to tell us what, what does it look like because that's what we want to do. That's who we want to be. We want to be the person Jesus calls us to be. Now, if we would be genuine followers of Jesus, which is to say if we would be saved, we must understand and accept the demands of discipleship. Now, last time, we unfolded the demands in verse 23, and I'll just briefly hit you with them here. First of all, we have to desire to follow Jesus. Verse 23, if anyone wishes to come after me, you have to want to follow Jesus. Nobody is saved who gets saved for mom. Nobody is saved who gets saved for spouse. You have to want to follow Jesus in your heart because you have heard the word of God and you desire to follow Jesus from yourself. Holy Spirit will give you that desire, but it must be your desire. It can't be the desire that you have to please somebody else. Second, the next demand is self-denial. You must desire to follow Jesus. You must deny yourself in verse 23. And we saw that that does not mean we deny ourselves certain things, like no meat on Fridays for a, a, a period of 40 days. No, that is not self-denial in the Bible. Self-denial means you reject the old person, and you say, I have no relationship with myself any longer. I no longer know who I am. The old man is a stranger to me. I have embraced Christ and my new life in Christ, and my old identity, I renounce it. 
Everything I was, everything I am in the flesh, I no longer desire those things. I no longer will indulge those things. I renounce them. We also must have a daily determination to die. He must take up his cross daily. And, and for the people who heard Jesus say this, it wasn't uh, sort of a nice religious thing to say. It was a very graphic and grotesque image, an image of a one-way trip to a crucifixion. People who were carrying crosses when they left home, didn't, they didn't show up at the dinner table that night. They were dead by the end of the day. And so this is the idea that every day that you wake up in your life, you die to yourself. You say to yourself, I will live for Christ today. I will die for Christ today if that's what he calls me to do. I may not come home tonight because of Jesus Christ, and I'm okay with that. Fourth, we must relentlessly follow. That's the last demand. Take up his cross daily, and then in the present tense, follow me. Continuously follow me. Never stop following me. And so this is what Jesus teaches are the demands. Those who would be his disciples must meet these demands. They must desire to follow him. They must renounce their, themselves. They must determine that they will die for Jesus if, if necessary on any given day. And they will follow him until the day that he calls them to himself in heaven or until he returns. Now this raises the question, who in their right mind would sign up for this? I mean... This is not come to Jesus and get healthy, wealthy, and, and have a nice life and live out in the suburbs and, and uh, you know, retire early and, and just live it up. This is come to Jesus and die. Say that you don't know yourself. Die, follow him, go wherever he says. Now, if I told you that to learn from me, you're going to have to desire to learn from me, first of all. And then you're going to have to renounce everything that you were and try to become like me and die for me on any given day that I tell you to and relentlessly follow me for the rest of your life. Let me tell you, find a new mentor, right? Don't follow me if those are my conditions for mentoring you. Because this is incredibly high, an incredibly high standard. Nobody in their right mind signs up to follow anybody who calls them to do this. Unless that person is Jesus. And Jesus explains why in verses 24 through 27, what he's asking us to do is not insane, but reasonable. Why we ought to do it. Why it makes sense to do it. And he does this by way of contrast. First, we have the contrast of destruction versus salvation in verse 24. If you wish to save your life, which is to say not follow Jesus, you'll die. You'll lose it. You'll be destroyed. But if you destroy your life for Jesus' sake, you will save it. Then we have the contrast of loss versus gain in verse 25. This is the idea of financial profit. You profit, you gain the whole world, you have all the money in the world, but not Jesus, you have nothing. Nothing but loss. You have nothing but Jesus, you send away earthly fame and treasure, and you have everything. You have the greatest profit anyone could ever imagine. Shame versus glory in verse 26. You don't follow Jesus. If you're ashamed of Jesus, when he comes back, he'll be ashamed of you. And when he comes back, if you follow him, you will be with him in his glory. And so this is why it's reasonable. Because Jesus gives to those who follow him these inestimable treasures of salvation and gain and glory. And if we don't follow him, the consequences are eternally disastrous. Now, there's a fourth contrast in verse 27, and this is where the cliffhanger was last time. Commentator and scholar C.E.B. Cranfield called Mark 9.1, which is a parallel of Luke 9.27, one of the most puzzling sayings of Christ in the Gospels. And so we left here in June. What is this fourth contrast, and how does it relate to the demands of of discipleship and why it is reasonable to follow Jesus. I'll give you the fourth contrast up front and then I'll explain it. The fourth contrast is error versus truth. Error versus truth. And that is in verse 27. But I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. 
Now, when I say error versus truth, what I mean by that is that Jesus' call to deny ourselves, to take up our cross daily, to relentlessly follow him is reasonable because by doing so, we escape from error and we are placed in the truth. We escape from delusions and lies and insanity and inconsistency and contradiction and illusions and fantasy, and we are firmly planted in the soil of reality and truth and logic and rationality and sanity when we choose to follow Jesus and accept the demands of discipleship. This enigmatic promise of Jesus explains that to follow him is to walk in the truth and to reject him is to plunge yourself beneath an ocean of error. Now, you say that really isn't obvious at all to me from verse 27. And so let's see if we can try to understand what is going on in verse 27. The first problem is we don't really know what it means. Maybe, maybe you have an inkling, maybe you studied it before, but, but generally speaking, this is a very difficult and confusing verse that people don't understand. And if you study it in detail, you'll soon discover that there are at least 10 different major interpretations of this verse. And uh, that's a lot. I mean, there's often 10 interpretations of any given verse, but you know, seven of them are minor and obscure, and only three of them are, are mainstream. But this one has 10 that are fairly well represented that are major interpretations and uh, let's let's think about some of them for a minute but before we do that i want to integrate this verse with the other places it appears in the gospels to give you the full picture matthew and mark both have this verse and they both word it differently which makes it all the more exciting to try to understand it matthew 16:28 is where it occurs in the gospel of matthew Matthew 16, 28, and Jesus says there, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And so you can see a little difference between Luke and Matthew. Luke says until they see the kingdom of God. Matthew says until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. A little bit of a, of a difference. Mark 9, 1 is the parallel in Mark, which I, as I mentioned a minute ago. And Jesus was saying to them, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. So Mark and Luke are similar in that they both have the object seen as the kingdom of God, whereas Matthew has what is seen as the person of Jesus. But Mark adds something after the kingdom of God. He says, after it has come with power. Luke 9, 27, until they see the kingdom of God. Luke is the most brief of the three. Now, when you analyze these, uh, these verses, uh, you, you may wonder, what do we do with these differences? Well, first of all, we have to begin by affirming these are compatible statements. Okay, we're not unbelievers, and we don't think there's a contradiction, and we don't think that some gospel writer got it wrong, and one other gospel writer fixed what he said wrong and corrected him. We understand these are all compatible statements. And we can go further and note they all refer to the same event. They all refer to the same thing. Jesus is not talking about different events, but one event here in the context. And so what that means is what Luke 9.27 means, how we understand that, has to fit with how we understand Matthew 16.28 and Mark 9.1. We can't say, as some scholars do, well, Luke meant this, but that's not at all what Matthew and Mark mean. That's not going to do. That, that, won't, that doesn't fit with how we understand the Bible. We don't know why the evangelists have a difference here in their statement. Uh, One reason, I believe, is because they all wrote independently. They didn't have each other's gospels in front of them. So they didn't, Matthew didn't know what Mark had written or Luke had written and and vice versa. And so they weren't copying off each other. They were writing as the Spirit led them to write. And the Spirit led them to each emphasize something a little differently. And so let's see what this means. Now, some have suggested that Jesus is referring by this to the second coming. Now, to hold this view, you have to believe one of two things. One, either Jesus was in error Or two, somebody, at least one person, is still alive that was there when Jesus said this because Jesus' second coming hasn't happened. 
And, and so those are the only two possibilities. We've got somebody on earth who's 2,000 years old, and uh, maybe they're living in a cave somewhere, and we don't know where they are, but they're afraid of modern science and, and uh, all those sorts of things. It's just a completely ridiculous thing, unless it's a superhero movie. Or we have a mistake by Jesus. Nobody I know argues that we have a 2,000-year-old man living on the earth. But many people do argue that Jesus made a mistake, that Jesus was just wrong. He thought he was going to come back uh, sometime in the lifetime of his disciples, but as it turns out, he was wrong. And uh, one person who argues this is named Bertrand Russell, and he wrote a book called Why I Am Not a Christian. He's an atheistic philosopher. And one of Russell's arguments against the truthfulness and goodness of Christianity was the way he read these kinds of verses. He said, look, Jesus clearly says he's coming in power and glory before the people who were there died. He didn't. So he was wrong. And you can do gymnastics to get through the text and try to make it mean something else. But the plain meaning of the text is Jesus coming back sometime before all these people die, and he didn't. Russell writes this. I am concerned with Christ as he appears in the Gospels, taking the Gospel narrative as it stands. And there one does find some things that do not seem to be very wise. For one thing, Jesus certainly thought that his second coming would occur in clouds of glory before the death of all the people who were living at that time. And then Russell goes on to quote Matthew 16, 28, which is one of our parallels, as one example. And then he concludes this, clearly Jesus was not so wise as some other people have been, and he was certainly not superlatively wise. Now, I bring this up not because I I am nervous that most of you believe this, but because a lot of people that you're going to encounter in the world, the only part of the Bible they've read is the part that's been misrepresented on the History Channel or on PBS. And and you get somebody like Bertrand Russell or some other uh, person with a PhD after their name who teaches at a prestigious university in the religion department, and they refer to things like this. And so you meet your neighbors, and they say, well, yeah, but didn't Jesus say he was coming back before people died uh, who heard him speak? And he didn't come back. And we have to be ready to, uh, you know, we can't just say, well, Jesus couldn't have been mistaken and leave it at that. We have to have some sort of answer for them when they say those kinds of things. And, uh, and, and there's a lot of ways we could answer Bertrand Russell and others like that. Uh, but we can answer them also from the text itself. Notice, first of all, in the text, that he says, I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now, the idea of this phrase, until, implies that they will see death. They just won't see it until they see the kingdom of God. It's not that they're never going to die. Jesus didn't say to you, I say to you truthfully, some of you aren't going to die. I'm going to come back first. Some of you won't taste death until you see this. Then you'll see this. Now, if Jesus meant the second coming, that makes no sense. If, when, when Jesus comes back, we're no longer afraid of death at that point. It, it, it's, it's glory at that point. However you work out the eschatology from there forward, for, for the people of God, death is, is a non-issue at that point. And so if Jesus here is talking about his second coming, for him to say they wouldn't taste death until that event makes no sense. And so Russell kind of has to twist his way through this passage to get it to say what he wants it to say. Now that doesn't deal with all of Russell's questions about Jesus' teachings in other places, but I think it answers this one. What Jesus expected some to see before death was clearly not the second coming in glory, or he would not have expected them to die after seeing it. Now a second option that many Christians hold is that Jesus was referring to his resurrection and or his ascension. And we saw why people might hold this in the Psalms. When we studied Psalm 2 and 16, 22 and 110, We saw that Jesus is enthroned, and we saw that he's reigning, and his kingdom has been inaugurated, and he is ruling in the midst of his enemies, and there's a future consummation that we're waiting for of this kingdom. But Jesus' resurrection and ascension inaugurated all of these events, and so some people say that is what Jesus meant. Some would live to see his resurrection and ascension. 
Now, if the question is simply, could the kingdom of God in Luke 9, 27, or the phrase kingdom of God refer to Jesus' resurrection or ascension, the answer to that question is yes, it could. And sometimes it does. But if the question is, does Jesus mean that here in this statement, it becomes less clear that yes is the right answer. Now, you remember, as we talked uh, a couple months ago, perhaps you remember that Jesus is about two and a half years into his ministry here. And so there's not a lot of time left. There's six to 12 months, maybe, left of, of ministry for Jesus before his death. And so it seems odd for Jesus to say, some of you are going to make it the next six months. I mean, wouldn't you feel a little strange if this morning in church I said, some of you will be here next Easter. Some of you won't die before Easter. Uh, you'd probably think, you know, is there a plague coming? I mean, why just some of us? Why not most of us won't die? Uh, you know, that, that's kind of a foreboding kind of comment. And so it seems unusual here for Jesus to indicate that his hearers, most of them would live another six months, uh, or some of them would live another six months. Could he have meant that? Perhaps. I mean, it's not out of the question, but it seems like an unlikely conclusion. This is also a problem for the third view, that it's a reference to this coming of the Spirit at Pentecost. Now, there was undoubtedly great power manifest at Pentecost, and people were overwhelmed by the preaching. Many conversions happened. The Spirit of God came in a mighty way. But this was not long after Jesus' resurrection, right? And so again, we're still talking just a matter of, of months here that Jesus is talking about. And he, he doesn't seem to indicate that the, only a few of his listeners will survive to Pentecost. All the disciples were still alive at Pentecost except for Judas. And, and so there's probably the vast majority of the crowd that was still there as well. The fourth view is uh, similar, and that is that Jesus is referencing the spread of the gospel through the book of Acts. Now, this is a little more likely because Acts covers about a 30-year period of time, and it doesn't seem unreasonable to say that, that some people that were there would be dead sometime in the next 30 years. A period of 30 years fits the time span better, especially when lifespans were shorter, uh, but uh, we'll just hold off on this view for a moment. Fifth, some understand Jesus to mean all of the above three views, not the view that doesn't fit with Scripture, but views two, three, and four. Daryl Bach takes this view, for example, and it is a bit tempting. It gives us a nice big time frame. Uh, but there's a number of problems with this view. First of all, it seems foreign to the context of Luke 9, as well as Matthew and Mark. The previous verse is not focused on the church and the expansion of the church, but notice verse 26. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. And so what is in view here in the context is not the establishment of the church, but the coming in glory of Jesus Christ. And so it would seem that the event in verse 27 has to somehow be connected to that coming in glory. This also misses the emphasis in Matthew that people would see the Son of Man himself, not simply the kingdom. Jesus did not have a, a, an appearance like we would expect in the book of Acts. He didn't come in clouds of glory in the book of Acts. And so it seems unlikely here that this is the kind of seeing involved. It also seems to ignore the context that follows where all three gospel writers place the transfiguration with a very specific time element of days attached. And we'll say more about that in a minute. And so it's true the kingdom of God has come upon us through the resurrection and ascension of Christ and through the spread of the gospel, but that doesn't seem to be Jesus' meaning here. Sixth, I'll throw it in there because it's becoming very popular again today, and that is that maybe Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Well, verse 27 doesn't read like a threat. It reads like a promise, like something hopeful. And whenever Jesus talks about the destruction of Jerusalem in the Gospel of Luke, it is spoken as a warning of judgment and as a threat, not as something to look forward to. And so verse 27 does not seem to indicate that this is the destruction of Jerusalem. So, what is it? The best understanding of this verse seems to be that Jesus is referencing the transfiguration the transfiguration, that what some will see before they die is the transfiguration. Let me explain why. First, this allows those who see the kingdom of God to taste death after seeing it. Those who saw the transfiguration saw the glorious uh, appearing of Christ and his kingdom, but then 
it went away, and then they died later on. Not right away, but some years later. Second, this limits the number to only some who were there. Since the vast majority of people who were there did not see the transfiguration. Even the majority of the disciples didn't see it. Only Peter, James, and John saw the transfiguration. So the word some makes sense in verse 27 if he's speaking of the transfiguration. Now somebody's objected and said, well, 99% of the people who were, who were there were still alive a week later, if not 100%. But the point is not that everybody who heard Jesus would die before this was fulfilled. The point is that some would see it before they died. Not that everyone who didn't see it would be dead, and that's why they didn't see it. And, and so that's not really a valid objection here. Jesus is saying here that some people would see something before they died, not that, every, not that most people would die before it happened. Third, this connects to verse 26 and the glorious coming of Jesus at the end with the event where Jesus is glorified before the disciples and they see him in that glorified state that he would have at his second coming. In the transfiguration, which we'll look at next week in detail, the disciples see a preview of the second coming. And so this organically connects all of this together. And finally, this view fits the context. This is what's happening in the Gospels as we go. Jesus is talking about discipleship. He's talking about his disciples. And he's talking about his coming in glory. He says some of them will see this glory. And then the next event, a few days later, some of them see his glory. And so it, it creates a nice narrative flow. Now, some of you have been waiting through all of this going, just get to the point, all right? I don't need to know all of these different views. What does this have to do with truth and error and the fourth point on the reasonableness of Jesus' demands of discipleship? And we're going to close with this. Turn over to 2 Peter. We'll make, we're going to tie all this together now. You've been very patient and indulged me, so now let's see if we can give you the payoff at the end here. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Peter is writing this letter. He knows he's going to die in the very near future, and he wants to ensure that once he has died, his readers are able to understand and remember the gospel and the word that he preached them. So he writes this letter to strengthen their faith and to always give them something, to give them something to always remember his teaching by. And with that context in mind, he writes in verse 16, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him where? On the holy mountain, on the mount of transfiguration is what Peter is talking about. So Peter here, he's referencing the transfiguration. You see that in verse 18. They're on the holy mountain. Verse 17, they hear the declaration from heaven. This is my beloved son. When we go through the transfiguration account, we'll see God's declaration about Jesus to the apostles, this inner circle of Jesus' apostles. And Peter, throughout his whole life, has never forgotten this amazing vision, this heavenly experience of seeing the glorified Christ in power on the mountain. Notice that Jesus calls the transfiguration in verse 16, the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you're reading along in, in 2 Peter, and you come to verse 16, and you stop at that comma, and you've never read it before, you might think Peter is talking about the second coming, right? When we saw the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wait a minute, Peter, you mean the, the parousia, the coming, has already happened? Well, Peter is clear in 2 Peter 3, it hasn't happened yet. No, I'm not talking about that, Peter's saying. I'm talking about what we saw on the mountain. What we saw was the power and coming of the majestic glory, Jesus in his kingdom and in his majesty. These are the key terms that are used to describe the transfiguration, the Son of Man coming, the, the kingdom of God having come with power. And so Peter is, is remembering these terms that he's taught, and he is calling our minds back to the gospel, back to Mark, which he wrote along with Mark. Mark. 
Peter then, seeing the Son of Man coming with the kingdom of God, coming with power, was seeing Jesus glorified on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now the point of all of this, where all of this is going in verse 16, notice, for we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made this known to you, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. In other words, listen, reader, I'm telling you the truth. I'm not lying to you. This is not religious hocus pocus. This is not a fairy tale. This is not a fable. This is not a myth. This is not a legend. This is not uh, the Roman gods giving birth to other gods. This is not some resurrection account from the Persians. This is not some cleverly devised tale. We were there. We saw it on the mountain. And if you believe this, Peter is saying, you have believed not a religious myth, but the truth. And so, Peter exhorts his readers, walk in the truth. Stay in the truth. If you depart from this, you're in error. Peter goes on in 2 Peter 1 to tell them that, he has, that, that we have now the even more sure word of God, which is even more certain than an experience. This word that God has spoken through his apostles and prophets. And Peter's point is pay attention to the truth. Because we saw this, we saw this glory, Jesus promised we would see it, he fulfilled it, and it is the truth, and we are eyewitnesses. Turn back to Luke 9, 27. And notice Jesus' solemnity in in verse 27. But I say to you, truthfully. See that word, truthfully? That is Jesus virtually giving an oath. This is Jesus underscoring, I am now asserting the truth. You can take it to the bank. You can put your life on it. You can rest on it for your eternal salvation. This is the truth. And then Jesus fulfills his promise with the transfiguration. Jesus speaks his word, and Jesus fulfills his word. And the only way to live in the truth is to live according to and trusting in his word. Any other life is a life where the only air you breathe is the toxic fumes of the devil's lies. In 2 Peter 1, Peter says that when we believe the truth and reject error, we live in the truth. And it's a wonderful thing he says. He says, and then, and only then, is the entrance to the kingdom of God opened to us. So you see how it all ties together. Jesus promises the vision of the kingdom of God because he is asserting truth. Peter conveys the vision of the kingdom of God so we will believe the truth. And when we believe the truth, we ourselves see the kingdom of God. It's a glorious statement in verse 27 and it it really requires its, its own Weak, its own message to fully understand. Do you want to see the kingdom of God? Well, you won't see it in the form of a transfiguration. You weren't Peter, James, or John. They're the only three privileged to see it in that form. But you can read the account of it in the Gospels in 2 Peter. But do you want to see the glorious kingdom previewed by the transfiguration? Do you want to partake in the glorious coming of Christ as one of his people rather than one of his enemies? Do you want to see the kingdom of God? That is what is at stake in the demands of discipleship. Will you see the kingdom of God or will you not? Will you see it as a citizen of the kingdom or will the kingdom come and crush the kingdom you're a citizen of? the kingdom of darkness, if you are not in Christ. This is what's at stake. Self-denial, daily bearing the cross, relentless following of Jesus. And it is wise to accept these demands. Because following Jesus means salvation and gain and glory and truth. And not following Jesus is destruction and loss and shame and error that kills. When we understand and when we accept the demands of discipleship, we see the kingdom of God.
Let's pray.